Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andy Serwer. I'm the editor-in-chief of Yahoo Finance, and I want to welcome all of you to this panel on the nature and future of work. Um, I think this is a really incredibly interesting topic, and I think it's at the very core of what the World Economic Forum has been discussing and working on, pun intended, for decades, and I think it will be the case for many years to come. This notion of what is work and the future of work is, of course, is of course also at the very core of so many socioeconomic and political trends around the world. So it is highly, highly salient, and I'm sure we're going to be hearing more about that over the next couple of days with some of the political leaders who have decided to come to Davos this year. We have an awesome, awesome panel, um, and I will introduce you to them now. To my far right is CVK, who is the CEO of HCL. <laughs> Got it. Um, and that is a, uh, a, an IT services firm, and we'll get into what he does. To my immediate right is Arlie Hochschild, <laughs> who is a writer and a professor at Cal Berkeley and an expert in this field. To my left, my immediate left, is Yuval Harari from the University of Jerusalem, a historian and the author of an awesome <coughs> book, Sapiens, the History of Humans, right? Which is a, a book that I, I, I think many people have read here at Davos. And to my far left is Mary Flanagan, who is an interdisciplinary scientist, inventor, artist, humanist, and also a professor at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, and a traveler of the world. <laughs> so let's get right into it. Yuval, I want to start with you because you're a historian and you've sort of studied mankind throughout the ages. <laughs> the medievalists, you're a Middle Ages scholar in particular, but you understand what, what work was about going back into time and history. So can you give us some context? I mean, what is this notion of work and human beings? What does it mean? for human beings to work? Ooh, that's a tough question. It's a biggie. I mean, it changed throughout history many times. Um, for much of history, people, people didn't work. They survived. I mean, the idea that you have, I have a job. I mean, this is my job. I get up, I go at 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock, I do this. This is quite a modern notion. This is not how hunter-gatherers uh, lived for hundreds of thousands of years. Now, of course, um, skepticism or, or anxiety about the loss of jobs is also not something new. Uh, certainly throughout the Industrial Revolution, for the last two or three centuries, there is always this fear the machines are taking over, we will become irrelevant. Um, but I think that this time it, it might be true. You know, like with the, 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 the guy who cried wolf, eventually the wolf really came. Right, okay, that's, that's a little scary. There's wolves of technology, <laughs> wolves. Um, so Arlie, let me ask you, I'm asking broad questions first, then we'll sort of drill down. Let me ask you, um, do you, what, what is the state of things right now? Do you consider us to be in a crisis in terms of matching work with humanity? How would you assess the state of affairs? I think we are facing a crisis uh, that we're not talking about. I don't feel that either in the United States, at least, left or right are really saying, hey, automation is here. We need to look at France, let's say. We need to, you know, continuing education. Um, so it's, uh, it is a crisis. And my fear is that some uh, political leaders will use the anxiety that crisis creates to blame people who are not at fault, like blacks and immigrants. OK. Um, CVK, I want to ask you a little bit about, um, maybe talk a little bit about what your company does, and then also give us a global perspective. Um, how equal is this change around the world? Yeah. Uh, we at HCL Technologies, uh, we are one of the fastest growing IT services companies about $8 billion, 120,000 people, uh, primarily all technology services uh, talent is what we have. And uh, as I s kind of look at this problem and then want to narrowly focus on technology industry, 
I think uh, the wolf is not going to come. That's the, really the, the strong belief that I have. Uh, and it's really, if you look at every technology company, there is a huge shortfall of skills. We are not able to hire the right skills, whether it is data scientists or cyber security specialists, even, uh, uh, even to do change management, even to do program management in a, in a modern context, it's so difficult to get the right talent. And every company, probably there are more than a million jobs in the technology sector which is not getting fulfilled with the right level of talent. So I, I do believe in the technology industry, the narrative is very different. Instead of looking at uh, job losses, it's really about how can you reskill and how can you get people much more uh, capable to deliver to the new demands of the day. I would say that. Great. Mary, I think it's safe to say you're a creative person. Um, and so I, I want to ask you uh, the kind of big question for you is, are we limiting ourselves in the way that we conceive of work and the way that human beings can think about work? What, are the, what can we do differently in terms of how we think about behavior and work? Well, this is a, a really great question because it builds on history, right? I mean, if we didn't have, have this notion of nine to five work before, and we have it now, we could see changes that, that are unfamiliar forms of work. So for example, thinking about new technological partnerships with groups of people working independently who might not be in a corporate structure, uh, cooperative uh, forms of, of new uh, initiatives. Like, uh, uh, I think we're gonna be seeing a lot of different formats for corporations and companies that we don't, we don't actually have a good uh, understanding for now. But, uh, and I, I think we've seen this in, in also the, the push towards the handmade, um, you know, with the automation and with, uh, with advanced we also will have a return to the kind of boutique fetishization of the object as well. So let us not forget the kinds of new markets that will be uh, emerging as we have um, more uh, capacities. We'll also have more um, need for the human in some places. I want to continue with you a little bit, Mary. And, and I know you do a lot of work with AI. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about how AI impacts work, I mean, we all know, okay, technology is displacing jobs, right, or changing them at least. Um, but how can AI, how is AI affecting jobs and work? Well, I mean, AI is the, the hot, one of the hot topics at the whole forum, so I, I, I'll only speak from my perspective on this, which is, you know, I, I think we, we have this discourse about um, AI in terms of automation and, and, and kind of uh, moving some simple tasks along. Um, this, is, this is beyond kind of like big data and other, and other forms of new knowledges that can emerge from, from AI. So we have lots of different levels at which AI is, is, is operating. For me, what's interesting is to figure out how the human matches into that equation. Um, I don't think AI necessarily re replaces, it's not like the job replacer or the job killer, so much as this um, a job, uh, uh, you know, in some cases, automation. But in other cases, it'll act as a partner or, a, or improve jobs or improve work, what you can do. My worry, of course, as a humanist, is to go back to how are we preparing people to think about this? How, how can we take someone who's, a, who's working at a grocery store and help them retool into another kind of work? And then what does society look like in that, in that equation? And those are really tricky areas I don't think we're prepared for in terms of how we even conceive education and, and preparation to live in our society. Uh, just two notes, uh, by the way, in terms of audience. Number one, the audience here, we will be going to you all for questions at some point. Um, about 30 minutes in, so get ready with questions, number one. And number two, I want to welcome everyone who's watching uh, this panel on the live stream, which we are streaming all across the world on Yahoo. Um, so Arlie, I want to talk to you about your book, Strangers in Their Own Land, which is, it sounds like a really fascinating um, study and work that you did, where you went to Louisiana and talked to people who, I guess you could say, we're feeling disenfranchised to a degree. What did you ask them and, and what did you yeah. find? Um, well, I spent five years um, first getting out of my bubble from Berkeley, California and uh, finding an equal and opposite 
bubble in um, southern Louisiana uh, among blue collar whites, many evangelicals, and really trying to take my own alarm system off and cross what I call an empathy wall so I could really hang out with them and see what what meanings, what feelings they had that underlay their politics. At the time, I didn't know that they would become ardent Trump supporters, but it turned out that I was, uh, that's who they were. So what I found, I'll just back up to say I started with this red state paradox. How could it be that across the US, it's the poorest states, the states with the, the worst health care, the worst education, um, the most disrupted families who take more money from the federal government in aid than they give to it in taxes, and yet they revile the federal government. Big Tea Party, they want to reduce the government. So I thought, well, I don't get that. That's what I, the question I brought with me. But when I got there, they dropped that question. That wasn't their question. That was my question. They said, okay, we know we're embarrassed to be so poor, but um, the real thing is something else. And that something else I came to feel was a deep story. What is a deep story? A deep story, you take facts out of it. You take moral precepts out of it. It's just what feels true about a salient situation. And you can tell it like a dream. By the way, left and right both have deep stories. But we have to, it's emotion based. And in the right, deep story. They're waiting in line, as in a pilgrimage, trying to f and facing the American dream. Their feet are tired. They feel they don't begrudge anybody. They're just waiting for the American dream. And then, in a moment, they see line cutters. Well, these are federally mandated affirmative action blacks who finally have access to jobs that have been reserved for whites, even worse, women who finally have access to jobs that have been reserved for men, immigrants, refugees, even animals. They think that the environmentalists are putting animals above people. All they see as line cutters, so it feels unfair. And then they see Barack Obama, in this case, as waving to the line cutters. Oh, he's their president. I'm left out. I'm pushed behind. So that's the deep story, and they felt that finally someone heard them. They didn't see anything else for them, not the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party. And someone swooped in, who is now our president, and said, I'm your guy. And they are that desperate. It's not that they love him, but nobody else seems to recognize the situation of, of decline. And they feel they're being bumped from about to be bumped uh, from uh, the good jobs they have or aspire to into the jobs that women and blacks do that are lower paid. And they think, in a way, what's happened to blacks ultimately is going to happen to us. So there's a desperation and an anxiety that I think has to be front and central. This third of the country, it's really important we address it and talk across this boundary. By the way, they want to talk. You mentioned a, a word I just picked up on, which is anxiety. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of anxiety out there. Um, fear, um, some of it unfounded. But when you feel anxious, when you feel depressed, that's, that's a reality. And you, Val, you have some thoughts on that, that people are coping um, with these kinds of fears of not being able to get the right jobs and work and how it extends to their, their lives writ large. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I think there are two <coughs> issues regarding anxiety we should face. First of all is that um, traditionally, uh, people in that situation faced exploitation. And you had this big socialist um, call to arms that the exploited should revolt. And being exploited is very bad, but at least you have power. Now people fear something far, far worse than exploitation. They fear irrelevance. Yes, that's right. When you're exploited, you're at least important. They can't shoot me. I mean, who would work? <laughs> when I'm irrelevant, that's far more scary. Yeah. So this is one anxiety that is, that is rising. And the other issue with anxiety is that I think that there will be new jobs. 
the big question is whether people will be able to reinvent themselves right. to fill these jobs. Right. And if you have to reinvent yourself every 10 years, because the automation revolution will not be a one-time affair. Right. Right. Yeah, we have a big revolution, everything is in chaos, and then it settles down to a new equilibrium, end of story. No, it will be a cascade of ever bigger revolutions and disruption. And then people have to reinvent themselves again and again, and that's extremely difficult. Yes, to reinvent yourself when you're 20, it's yes. difficult, but you do it. Yes. To do it again at 30, at 40, at 50, that's very high levels of anxiety. Right. All right, so you got wolves and constant revolutions over here, <laughs> Yuval, and this is, this is <laughs> tricky stuff. Um, but I, I think you're, you're very much on to something. And mm -hmm. I, I wanna ask you, CVK, a little bit about this and you know, but the the job elimination and losses are real. I mean, McKinsey has a study that says that one third of all workers in the U.S. and Germany will have to find new types of jobs um, over you know, say a ten year period. And so, CBK, you've talked about new formats for jobs, and and I'm curious as to what that means exactly. Uh, I think uh, the formats of jobs are changing in several dimensions. I mean, first, somebody alluded that it's not an eight to five kind of jobs. It's, it's very flexible hours. That's one fundamental change. Uh, second is, as a society, we've been used to uh, 15 or 20 years of education followed by uh, several decades of professional career and work. I think that's going to change. We're, we're in a world where it's a, it's a state of continuous learning. You learn, you acquire new skills. Just taking on the point that he said, uh, you have to reinvent yourself. You need to be continuously learning. I think that's a very, very important dimension of keeping yourself relevant uh, in, the, in the new paradigm. And uh, it's again, um, you tend to work with more humans as colleagues. We need to get used to working with humanoids as colleagues because it's, it's really artificial intelligence, robotics, all of them it's very important to recognize that they enable humans to do some things better and faster. I think as long as that uh, thought is clearly embedded in the minds and that's the narrative, then you are a lot more working constructively to find solutions. It's, I mean, even if you look at any study, I mean, you mentioned about McKinsey, there's a Gartner study which says in the next three years, 1.8 million jobs will be lost, but there's a 2.3 million new jobs which are getting created. Uh, so I think any study talks about uh, changing profile of the work, the repetitive, monotonous work. Obviously, throughout the history, they've got automated, they've got eliminated, but more creative, more unique, uh, more thinking-oriented jobs continue to evolve. Uh, I think it's just recognition of this, and then we really focus on doing something about uh, changing or reskilling uh, the broader workforce. Th that's where the solution lies. I want to talk, get uh, drilled down into some of those numbers because you can see there's all kinds of data out That's there true. and you can find the data that kind of matches your viewpoint to an extent. <laughs> it's always kind of the case, but yeah. here in particular. Let me ask you just point blank about outsourcing because sure. I, you know this is what you do. And is outsourcing bad for developed countries and good for developing countries? Net, net, pure and simple. Okay. Absolutely not. Uh, I think if you, you need to look at outsourcing in, in different colors. If you look at the technology industry, uh, today every business uh, is getting reinvented with technology at the core. The technology intensity in the industry is uh, growing at tremendously and even exponentially. So I think outsourcing is truly creating jobs because your ability to address or serve the needs of the technology intensity that's really on in the play in every enterprise is the, is the core of creating more uh, white collar jobs. And I think we are a big enabler. Uh, we bring in, uh, we are probably the only industry which is bringing in a lot of young talent and really uh, making them better equipped to deal with the technology requirements uh, that the future is uh, uh, looking at. Okay. Mary, I want to ask you about gender and jobs and the future of work. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> it's a question. Um, will women be hurt more or less um, with the changes coming to employment, do you think? Well, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the big fear um, for most people engaged in any kind of, uh, uh, you know, looking at the biases in, in our systems. 
if we're getting rid of some of the low paying jobs, they tend to be um, people of color and women, at least in the United States. They might be immigrants, migrants, or, or those less educated. So, so we have to really understand the class implications of technological development um, and the infrastructural racism that could result um, and sexism and gender that could result as a form of, of, this, of this kind of thing. Now, how we, how, we, how we get over this is a really interesting question, and I want to go back to this notion of education. If, if, if we really think, I mean, what if we throw, throw out the idea of, uni I'm, I'm at a university, so you know, apologies to Dartmouth, but like, <laughs> if we throw out the idea of university as a one-time thing, and we think about lifelong learning, and we think about the kind of experiential learning that has to be happening the rest of our lives in order to keep up with ourselves, in our own work environment. It changes um, how universities might become partners with uh, institutions and businesses. We might have a, a kind of spiral. And I think this would also work um, and help shifting some of these um, class issues. Because right now, we don't have um, a huge section of the population even attending college. It's not relevant. How do you make it relevant? It's necessary to work in the, in the, in the, it's the backbone of the infrastructure of society, right? So, so I think shifting the role of education may be a, a, a dire need really quickly, actually. Um, and I don't think institutions are thinking this way at all. We're thinking about ex we're thinking about online learning and expanding skills, but it's really these mindset. We, how are you going to create a, 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 a creative class? Uh, you know, like that's something that doesn't happen in an online class of clicking your buttons. You know, like this is something experiential. It's lived. Um, we really need to retool and reinvest in our learning situations, whether they be universities or some other model. You mentioned lower skilled jobs being displaced and maybe women being disproportionately represented in those jobs. And one job that comes to mind uh, that I think is front and center this week is cashiers yeah. at stores. And I'm saying that because I don't know if you guys saw this, but Amazon opened up its first cashierless store. And at first when I saw that, I said, oh, I'm familiar with that. I've seen that in the airports. So you just check out yourself. But it's not like that. It's a lot easier because, I don't know, if, again, if you saw this, but it's with the app and you have Amazon's app and you scan the app when you walk into the Amazon store and then you go into the store and you just pick things off the shelf and walk out. Yep. And it scans the things that you are walking with. So it's much easier because I always found those self-checkout things yeah, to be very right. clunky and slow. And that's a right. first-gen thing. And I always yeah. go to the yeah. cashier because yeah. yeah. the cashier is faster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> than you are. Yeah. Which is job security. Yeah. But this Amazon thing is not job security. And let me see here. I've got there's 3.5 million cashiers yeah. in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. um, think about that. And then another one, which is at risk, we're, we'll talk about jobs at risk, are truck drivers. The truck drivers, again, in the United States, right. the biggest job category, right. the number one job in the United States is truck drivers, and we've all heard about driverless trucks coming. Um, so Arlie, I, I just want to ask you if you've you know, given any thought to what kind of work will we be doing, and, and what kind of work do the subjects of your book aspire to, maybe is a, is a question I could ask you then. Yeah, um, the first thing I'd say is that work, the, the fact of work, is hugely moral for the people I came to know in Louisiana. In other words, I talked with one woman who said, uh, I'm a worker, you know. Mm. She didn't tell me how good she was at the work. She didn't tell me that was how, she identified how important herself. You know, consequential, did it make a better world? It wasn't that. It was just, I work. And she attached pride to that. And so desperate was it that she said, actually, I think we ought to go to Europe and France and take all the, um, the graveyards of, uh, of fallen American soldiers from World War I and II, bring those graveyards back to Louisiana or somewhere else where American workers can tend the graves and with American lawnmowers can, can mow the lawn. Wow. This was wow. her, her <laughs> feeling. <laughs> and it Lots wasn't. There. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, so, um, it, and she looked down on people. This is the other side that's really important, uh, on people who did not work. It was, uh, people would say to me things like, oh, you know, at 7th and Broad Street, 
they're uh, giving out Obama phones to the, the people that don't work. You know, these are uh, uh, phones. Uh, go look as if this, this was a shame spot. You know, this is the people that don't work, they go there. Or another grocery store, you know, when they get their welfare checks, they buy chickens over there. You should go over there and look. What was I being told to do but to experience the shame that they attach to non-work? So where you're talking about a change of mental set, and you too, that we have to reschool ourselves, but the people I'm talking to, the Trump supporters, are, uh, they're not ready at all. And I would add a gender point um, that I think part of what I saw being tapped is a crisis in manhood. Yeah. I think that Donald Trump has tapped into some anxiety again, uh, that men are feeling even more than women. And that, uh, I know there's some uh, uh, research done at Berkeley that indicates that first generation college students, you know, should I go to college or not, women are more likely to say, okay, do I dare accumulate the debt? Yes, I do. And it's the guys who say, no, I don't dare go to college because it would cost too much. And they're staying in the blue collar uh, avenue. Well, that's the most vulnerable avenue. So I think we have to look at men uh, as in crisis and anxious and find a solution. No, I think you're spot on. I mean, especially younger women are particularly achieving more, you yeah. know, that, that generation yeah. than Gen yeah. X and Gen Z. Um, and by the way, I also want to make a point that, you know, and I'm sorry if we're talking a little bit about the United States too much, but I think that all of these trends that we're talking about apply to Europe and other parts of the world as well, particularly Europe. Um, it's developed countries. I mean, you've seen the same political um, reactions and traits and trends in Europe, in many countries in Europe, that you have, are seeing in the United States. So it's sort of metaphorical and emblematic that way. Um, Yuval, I want to ask you about humans and work again. What, what work are humans best suited to do? And what work makes the most sense for humans to do now and in the future? Oof. <laughs> I'll give you the hard ones. You keep coming back with the wolves and the revolutions. And, so I'm giving you the hard ones. Well, you know, a lot of what people do is just not recognized as work. Like raising kids, it's not recognized mm -hmm. as work. You can just, you know, change the label and say, oh, there is plenty of work for everybody. <laughs> it's just whether you recognize it as such or not. And certainly much of the work that people do today or in the last century or two, it's definitely not in their nature to just stand like Charlie Chaplin in a, in a, in a big factory mm -hmm. and just uh, screw something uh, all day. Um, we are, we are, as, 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 as we evolved as hunter-gatherers, we are much more adapted to go to the forest, look for mushrooms, climb trees, and things like that. But who does that today? <laughs> so um, there is no, I mean, we are beyond the, the point when you can say you, there is a natural human uh, work or there is a natural human job, the, the, the lines keep shifting, especially not just as AI is developing. I think there is far too much focus on AI and robotics when we talk about the future of the job market. And we should pay equal attention to what is happening on the biotechnological front mm -hmm. and especially to our ability to decipher human beings decipher the human brain, a lot of jobs depend on the ability to understand human emotions. I mean, even to just, you know, drive a car, you need to understand these pedestrians, how are they behaving? Certainly, if you want to replace, I don't know, bankers or, or social workers, you need understanding of human emotions. Mm -hmm. And the big revolution, which is happening in parallel with AI machine learning, is deciphering the human brain. And we could reach a point in the not too distant future that AI could have better emotional intelligence mm -hmm. than human beings. They won't have consciousness, mm -hmm. they won't have feelings of their own, but if you accept what the life sciences are telling us, that emotions are just biochemical algorithms, they are not some metaphysical spirit, then we are very close to the point when an AI will, be, will have better emotional intelligence no. than human beings. 
But so what are we left to do then? That's the big question. This is the question of our panel. <laughs> exactly. Well, so I'm Moderator. asking, you have to answer. I mean, so we talked about this. We talked about these jobs, and we talked about this back in our prep session. You know, what jobs is kind of a parlor game, okay? Oh, 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 What's, what jobs are vulnerable, what jobs are not? Go ahead, I'm sorry. One, again, just thinking in a slightly different way, is we don't have to protect jobs. We have to protect people. Yeah. I mean, you could have scenarios in which you ditch jobs. I mean, most jobs are not worth keeping. I mean, who wants to be a cashier in all his life? I mean, this is, this is the, the meaning of my life. I, I'm a cashier and I, I, don't, I don't want this. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I have to do it, but it's not like something, oh, we have to, to save the cashiers. So we really need mm -hmm. to protect the, the humans, not the jobs. And the, the crisis here is a crisis of meaning, yes. not of employment. That's if, right. you can, if you can solve the crisis of meaning, mm -hmm. then you can forget about jobs. But, but there's also... There's, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. No, OK. OK. There, there's also a, a political question, though, and, and you sp that maybe this is linked to, which is universal income. Right. Right? Right. And how many, let me ask the audience, how many people believe in universal income? Mm -hmm. that would Some be people, we can. Five, six. Yeah. A lot of people do, but a, a lot more people don't. Um, <laughs> So is there anyone who wants to talk about universal income and why it's a good idea? Women. We'll get to that. Maybe we'll get back to that. I, I, I just think, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, CBK, I want to go over to you and ask you then, though, um, what jobs do you think are the most easy to replace and what are the most difficult to replace think, with technology? I think at the very basic level, uh, all the jobs that the left brain does is something which can be automated. And the right brain is where you will find it very, very difficult. It's emotions, while you can describe it as chemical reactions to understand and decipher and uh, for the technology to evolve, it is really a long way off. So it's the creative, unique uh, jobs which need a lot of thinking. I think pretty much the right brain is what is not replaceable, I would say. Mary, do you have examples of people who are using creativity to sort of redefine their work? I mean, you sure. meet with all different types of people who are doing really cool things. Well, s since 1973, an artist, Harold Cohen, actually developed an AI to, to paint paintings. So he wanted to, he, wanted to, he wanted to paint, but he thought he was a bad painter, so he just made an AI to paint. And then the AI was called Aaron, and Aaron started painting and selling his paintings. Oh. <laughs> and Aaron's paintings sell for quite a, they're, they're doing all right. So, so, so this partnership with um, using AI or, or, or kind of uh, the, this partnership in, in, in using, a, using a tool as a creative process is, is a long time coming, actually. Artists have been thinking about this the whole time. So um, as soon as there's a, there's a technology, artists are doing, I would encourage everybody to look at what artists are doing today about social media and about uh, uh, you know, issues of privacy, because that's where the critique and the new tools actually come out is, uh, in the dialogue. We, you, it, it will surface in culture 20 years later. <laughs> so, right. so it's interesting. But, but th that's one example I can give you um, where, where we have this kind of f fusing. Right. People talk about that partnership of human and machine as the sort of ultimate paradigm going forward. I mean, there are also things we were talking about this as well, that jobs that um, are not repetitive and deal with unexpected events. What was that one? Oh. The plumber? Oh, yeah, oh, no, the, definitely, yes. I, I had forgotten about my plumber analogy. Yes, right. the, plumber, the plumber is, is, is a very safe job, <laughs> I think. Right. It, you know, uh, it, 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 finding, a, finding a frozen pipe in, and, and trying to figure this out, it, plumbing is not standardized. You know, anything that's not standardized and very difficult to kind of parse, I think, is, 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 a, is, is on the way to humans being able to, to uh, be a little bit more uh, apt at that particular position than, than, a, than a computer. Although never say never, you know? Right. I mean, we, the technology will always surprise us as where it comes in and is very useful and where it isn't. And that's, again, uh, great. But uh, I don't think that there's a burning desire to make AI for make, be replacing artists. It's not like that's the, the forefront of the jobs today. You know, <laughs> I'd be more right. interested in thinking about how, how do you, could you automate project management? 
um, right. you know, multitasking and seeing if you're behind and, and getting your team, mem motivating your team members. How do, what does that look like? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Not everyone would think that's a safe job because it requires so many human skills. Huh. What would, what would that look like? So these thought experiments, I think, help us try to see where humans um, are, are strong uh, at, at particular positions and, and also the ethical questions. Anytime there's an ethical question, humans need to be there <laughs> to be deciding those, those ethical questions. Yeah, I've seen algorithms with ethical questions um, in Silicon Valley, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, which is maybe not a good uh, success rate when it comes to ethical questions. But you also of humans mm -hmm. also. Yeah, I suppose so. We're, yes. We're not well, we're not infallible when it comes to ethical questions, are we? No. no. We're not infallible, period. Right. Yes. In fact, we're quite fallible. Yes. And but are machines fallible? Yes. Right. Yes. But maybe right. at a, 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 it depends on the rate of fallibility. <laughs> who's programming them? Well, you also talked about, um, you know, uh, people gardening is a job that may be safe, and lawn care, you know, things like that, or being a dentist, things, is, but, but all those things could be. In fact, I was looking at something, and one study showed that a very uh, safe job from technology, uh, and I mentioned this to you guys, was a clergy, right. uh, a minister. Uh, that is until I found there was an app <laughs> called Confession <laughs> with a drop-down menu for sins. So is to there your, an other? Is yeah. there an other? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to your point, Mary, I mean, yeah. just you think you're, you're safe, and then maybe three years yeah. later you're, you're not so safe. Um, I think we should watch the safe word, though, because it's not about okay. whether we're safe or not. It's how we can use this technology. I mean, I, I do want to be an optimist and say, okay, well, you know, we have to design for the human, and we have to have certain ethical standards for that. But but it's always going to be a dance, I think, no. um, between the technology and the people. And where I was hanging out uh, uh, in Louisiana, religion is hugely important. There's a church at every block and big mega churches, and I don't think they would use this app. And the <laughs> more the more anxious they become about the loss of a moral self and meaning, uh, the more they would turn to church, I think. Uh, yeah. And Or the other thing they turn to is opioids and drugs, right. um, sadly. And then that becomes a whole other place, sadly, of job creation, which is um, people who are, work in addiction and first responders mm. in your state of New Hampshire That's right. um, are very, very busy because they have a huge heroin, fentanyl, and opioid problem in that state. And maybe, you know, it's a, it's a growth category, but it's kind of, kind right. of a sad one. Right, right. I want to ask you, Arlie, a little bit about the government because that was sort of a key issue for the people in your book. And... Is government, can government be a source of help for people as they transition to other jobs? There was a program in West Virginia where they were trying to help coal miners become coders. Right. And yeah, it, it sounds a little silly maybe, but no. a lot of people signed up. There were, there were 50 openings and yeah. 700 people signed up. That's my next project, actually. I, I got a call from... Uh, a Democratic congressman, 17th District in California, Bo, uh, his name is, and he made a, Ocon, uh, an agreement. He, his constituency is uh, Silicon Valley. And he said, um, half of my constituency are Asian, I'm Asian myself. And he made a deal with a Republican congressman from Paintsville, Kentucky, whose uh, constituency are unemployed coal miners. And what they have done is set up coding uh, program, takes uh, uh, 30 weeks, you get $400 a week, and are promised a $40,000 a year job. If you succeed, the first 30 uh, uh, students have graduated, and they uh, they call themselves now Silicon Hollow. <laughs> so um, they're staying right there in Kentucky. They don't want to move, but they're doing coding for apps for cell phones. So will their jobs be automated out? Well, maybe eventually, but, and are older people graduating from these courses? I'm gonna find out. 
but uh, it's a start, and I liked it that it seemed bipartisan and forward-looking, and um, incidentally, in Paintsville, Kentucky, there's an opiate addiction uh, huge problem, right. and presumably this could help with that. You mentioned Asia, um, and I want to talk to you, CVK, about that, and government policies in the two most populous countries in the world, India and China. And I, I would maintain that jobs and having a robust job economy is a policy slash obsession of the Chinese government. Yep. And I'm wondering what your take on that is, and in India as well, is, is that an obsession for Prime Minister Modi? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, uh, if you just try and uh, differentiate how this problem manifests in Asia versus the rest of the world, I think the fundamental difference is in the demographics. The number of uh, young graduates or people, millennials, who are getting into the workforce every year is more than the population of a few countries, mm -hmm. right? So I think the challenge is of a very different dimension, which is posed by the demographics. So I think job creation, trying to kind of train them and make them equipped for the entry-level jobs is the big agenda. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's a big agenda in India, and so is the case with uh, China as well. Yeah, in China. And I think go ahead, all, all of them have a role to play. The, the academia has a big role to play because the, the, the nature of education is, is quite uh, not aligned to what the job requirements are. There is a huge uh, gap between them. So there is a lot of effort going into training them to make them eligible for the jobs. And uh, government also has a big role to play because the availability of access to training, uh, uh, awareness of what are the right skills to really uh, build capabilities on, and industry as well. I mean, industry needs to bridge the gap between um, the educated and education and employability. I think that's a big gap, especially on the technology industry. It's a very big thing. Someone made the point, and I don't know if this is um, urban myth or not, but then in China, for instance, a lot, there are so many technology graduates that the government uses those graduates as part of the um, security apparatus, that the filling all those jobs of people um, surveilling the population of China and the populations of other parts of the world is actually, sure, it's security, but it's also, we need to get jobs for these people. Yeah. So um, wow. the implications there are, are, are sort of interesting as well. Again, you hear things in the United States about China that are not necessarily the case, so we have to be careful about that. Um, I want to see if we can go to the audience uh, and get some questions from you guys. Oh, we got some people right away, right away. Um, <coughs> do we have microphone? We do. There's two people. You have to choose between those two. It's your, okay, he did it. Please. Good afternoon. I'm a global shaper from Kazan. My name is Leysan. I'm also from educational system, and I'm an associate professor in the university, and I have a question. How and who should change our traditional educational system? And could you please describe ideal future uh, educational system and how it will look looks like, in your opinion, maybe? Very, very, I, I want to say very big thank you to you for incredible discussion. Thank you. We have two academics here. You guys both want to answer it? For mm. One at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Go ahead. Sing. Yeah. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> or anyone else. You can, three yeah, academics. Yeah, we I'm have sorry, three you academics. Yes. Okay. You too. Yeah. <laughs> so many academics. Right. Uh, I'll start because I'm verbose and I have really, <laughs> really clear things, that, uh, hopefully clear things. So I've been advocating since I came, to, I've been at Dartmouth nine years, and I've been advocating that we throw out classrooms and just throw out the whole notion of, of, of the way we, we learn and we teach in project teams and tackle real world problems that also include philosophers, social scientists, hard scientists, technologists, and we just go around and, and artists and, and, and work as project teams doing a whole curriculum in this kind of way. So that's my, that's been my proposal. No one's listening to me, but, but it's great. It's, I, just, I propose these things. Um, and I really do believe that there's this, there's, there's a, we, we need to reshape even not only the, the way that disciplines work together and specialties and generalizations for 21st century skills, we call these, you know, uh, 
things like creative problem solving, things like even the wow factor, being excited about things is like a, like a kind of skill. We don't, need, we don't need information. We need information retention. We need, we need cross-disciplinary thinkers who can, who can grab onto solutions. Um, uh, but I also, there, there's, there's that sense, but it's also about teamwork. And I wanted to get back to this whole, we haven't traditionally, at least in, 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 in formal United States learning structures, emphasize teamwork, and I know that that's different around the world, but teamwork is really still very uncomfortable for students and very uh, untrusted uh, and, and, and difficult to assess. And, and obviously, I also do game design, and, and, and those are very team-based kinds of things to do. Uh, so, so teamwork is still something, it, it should be a natural thing that is a, a part, humans are social creatures, whether we like to think about it or not. So, <laughs> oh, that was a cell phone, I don't know. Good. All right. <laughs> Just not hiding, you know, <laughs> like, I could do that too, as a social creature. But like, uh, so that's one proposal for you. You, Val, you have anything to add to you, from the University of Jerusalem? Go ahead, Arlie. You want to... I, I love Sorry. what you just said, Mary. Mm -hmm. that, that really is, sounds very exciting. What I would add to it, I think, is uh, the idea of universities uh, getting out of their moral bubbles. Uh, there is a big split between people who r live in rural areas who resent the elite class and then there are universities who produce the elite class and a sense of, wow, you're so special. You were chosen to study at Oxford or Harvard or Berkeley. And we've got to get rid of that. We need exchange programs between um, rural and urban universities. Uh, Berkeley is now trying to get an exchange program with the University of Mississippi, for example. I think more of that to break down the sense of isolation um, and othering. Uh, so I would add that and the idea of continuing education. Anything you want to add? Yeah, just that any solution will have to be lifelong uh, education, which mm -hmm. breaks the, 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 the sharp divide uh, between the uh, school and real life. And also the really big problem is, is scalability. I mean, we can think all kinds of yeah. very creative solutions mm -hmm. which can be applied in, I don't know, Silicon Valley. But uh, what do you do about the millions of people who lose their jobs in Bangladesh producing shirts? Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of education will they get or do they get today that will enable them to cope yeah. with the immense challenge, challenges ahead? So, I mean, the, the big thing working for the old fashioned industrial era education is that it's scalable. Mm -hmm. And we need to compete with the scalability, not just with mm -hmm. uh, coming up with some bright idea. Very good, very good. Mm -hmm. Good question. Oh, here, we've got Thanks a microphone, so sorry. Fantastic panel. Um, uh, I'm coming from the London School of Economics, in fact. And my question is to, to Professor Harari, who is my intellectual hero. Um, <laughs> where is leisure? Mm -hmm. Where is leisure in all this discussion? Mm -hmm. We have been talking about jobs and, 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 and but the counterparty to this is that leisure has increased over time and it's qualitatively has been revolutionized. The way I spend my leisure is very different, very sort of intellectually much more enriching and humanly much more enriching than ever before, thanks to technology and all the access, um, sort of very cost-effective access. So where is leisure on this, in all this? Well, it, it's, it's the other side of the coin. If you solve the problem of, 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 of meaning especially, then that, that's really the, the problem of leisure. Um, and I'm not, I don't think we've been doing very well uh, with leisure, despite all the advances. Um, we have people today, I mean, I'm living in, at least in, in, in many parts of the world compared to what their ancestors in the Middle Ages dreamt about. People today in many parts of the world are living in paradise, but it doesn't feel like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? Because we don't know, I mean, we are, I mean, we are no, good we when it comes to being efficient and working hard and all that, but when, okay, you've done it, now just take it easy and, and, and yeah. we can't do it. It's no because moral, these maybe. are always, we always, one of the reasons we always have these, right? Is and that, that also is a form of work, by the yes. way. Let's just uh, talk about our day. Very much yeah. so, yeah. right? I mean, there was this line that Keynes said, we would only be working 15 hour weeks but we're actually now working 15-hour days. Yeah, It's right, kind of right. a familiar yeah. trope, but right, right. anyway, that's a very interesting right. point. Question over here, these people? Yeah. This person here. Hi, uh, fantastic discussion. I'm Risalat, I'm a global shaper from the Dhaka Hub in Bangladesh. Um, so 
all of you have uh, alluded to the pace of change and how fast it is changing. But I think one of the things that doesn't feature in the discussion as much is why. Um, I think uh, there are like forces that are hidden in plain view that are driving many of these changes. Like for a company, for example, uh, you have clear incentives to replace labor with capital. Um, so these uh, conversations, like those hidden forces, can we, can we bring them into the discussion and think about how we can change the incentives to prioritize people and not just the drive for efficiency at the expense of people? Thanks. Um, so your thoughts on that, please. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a business question. Yeah, I mean, this is it's important. Businesses and corporations are always going to push the envelope of efficiency, right? And I think every time when they've done that, the outcomes have been better. Right. One is you may have eliminated some jobs, but the quality of what is being done, the speed at which things are being done, that only benefits the larger, larger good. Now, uh, at the same time, the businesses will also have to take responsibility of how are they trying to deal with uh, the job losses, right? I mean, to some extent, uh, you're, you're working on an outcome which is driven by the, your shareholders and what the capitalistic economy is looking at. But if you just step back a little bit, a uh, lot of companies are investing in training. I think the training budgets across the world, any in, most enterprises are continuing to enhance the training budgets. So I think you need to do it in a very responsible manner. I think we should just try and push the envelope on that as well. You, you, you focus on efficiency, push the envelope uh, to the maximum but also look at what is the path for innovation, how can you enable that by better investments in learning and development, I would say. Arlie, you had a uh, comment. I, I like this question very much, and I think it's very important. Um, I think it's uh, connected to the question of uh, the distribution of uh, wealth uh, in the, the world and the country, speaking of the United States, uh, does automation mean that uh, uh, capital is, is getting concentrated for the people who are in the companies that uh, produce uh, automation and being taken from people uh, that don't do that? This uh, question really is central. That's why I like your question. Um, and I would add the political consequences of this. If the people that I studied, you know, the third of the, the US who, who really feel that Trump is their savior, and they increasingly lose money in this redistribution, um, they, and Trump is, um, is offering them symbolically a few new jobs, so look, uh, you know, we'll bring, uh, uh, carrier jobs, for example, back to the US. But he really doesn't do anything, and he doesn't do anything about reskilling, or uh, then people are going to be really uh, fearful, anxious, and he's going to redirect blame for their unhappiness toward immigrants, toward blacks, toward women. Um, I think we need to think about redistribution and the political manipulation of the anxiety that produces. And maybe really underlying it, you know, of course, is the digital revolution, right? I mean, it's sort of, I guess, a given. We haven't even said that, but that's what's really the cause, the proximate cause, the accelerant, and maybe why Yuval's wolf is real this time, because we've never seen anything like this in the history of mankind, right? Andy, I think, I think to, to build on this conversation and to, to really be inspired by your question, we do have to, as societies, think about what's enough. Like, what is enough? And, and can we reach that? I mean, and this goes back to the meaning, right? Like, what is a meaningful life? What is enough? And we don't ask that enough. I, that is not enough. I will say that. Uh, and we, you know, instead, we, 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 this, uh, this idea of progress re really might need to be questioned. You know, what, what, why have all the speed and efficiency when I don't meet a human face during my day? Um, we, 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 we have grocery stores, and we, we get rid of all of the human employees because it's very efficient. What is my life like as a person walking down the street, not seeing people? 
Um, we're not built for that. Um, we can try to adapt to that, but why would we build a world in which we don't want to live in? We keep doing that. So I think we might want to take a step back and say, okay, well, how do we manage this, this obsession with progress and growth? What is that? Why are, we, why are we so obsessed with that? And could we say maybe we have enough and we need to share? Question over here. Hi. Um, I'm, my name is Zina, but I'm a global shaper as well from Geneva, Switzerland. And my question is, I mean, you've all mentioned, you've talked about the responsibility of both the companies and the educational system and how all these need to work together to shift the mindset of people as well from going from the traditional mindset of waiting for the 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 education or the university to, to, to teach you or the companies to train you and move towards reinventing yourself and continuous learning. So my question here is, what can we do as individuals what we, while we wait for all these changes to come together? What can we do right now as we're trying to move towards personal development and owning our own careers? But concretely, like, what can we do? Push I mean, for work, like continuing workers? education. I wouldn't wait. <laughs> I would uh, get into an activist mode uh, and uh, push for precisely the kind of innovation I think Mary's talking about. Um, uh, I think Macron is talking about uh, giving uh, funds to citizens that can be used for lifelong learning. France. We could take that as a model. Uh, I think uh, to other less advanced countries like my own. <laughs> Any, uh, go ahead. I think it's really a question of who you are. I mean, people are in extremely different situations, and uh, this means they have different opportunities. There is no universal individual that you can give an advice to. I mean, th the best advice I could give is to invest above all in your own mental resilience. Because in times of chaos, in times, I mean, the only certainty is it's, it's going, there's going to be change, lots of change. So anything particular you're investing, like learning how to code or do this or this particular skill, it's, it's a bet. And you don't really know whether this skill will actually be necessary. The one thing that you will need, certainly, is emotional resilience and mental resilience to, to, to just survive with all this change, all this stress. But uh, this is very, very difficult. Uh, there is no, I don't know of any course in university which teaches you how to be emotionally resilient. Um, there should be. And there should well, be. There's some, some pedagogies do focus on growth mindset, however. Mm -hmm. there, there are actually companies, there's a company, for instance, called General Assembly, which maybe solves two problems at the same time, where you can go and it's in cities around the world, for instance, and you can go there and learn, yes, you can learn to code, but other business skills. But beyond that, you're with other people. Yes, right, to your point. Good. So you're communally learning and growing and challenging and adapting to the new economy and socializing at the same time. Whoa, which seems Keep pretty good cool. Keep friends. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're getting close to the end of the session and just to, to one more quick one. Is it a quick one? Yeah. Good, okay. Let's just do that. I always wanna make sure people are. Um, what we're talking actually about are two different things. One's putting jobs out of work. If you look at the caring economy, which is unpaid, we can call it jobs, and that was discussed. What actually we are talking about is that if the wolf is really real this time, what's the insurance policy we have? So we probably have to look at basic income. And if basic income has two different concerns, one is it is affordable, and there are studies going on, and it will be cleared. Sometimes the studies say it will be more expensive, but it doesn't take into account that if you have basic income and health care, the preventative aspect of health care will have far-reaching consequences in the budgetary affordability. But the other thing is, and that's very important, is job is not just about income. It actually is about social worth, which probably is a more pragmatic and practical illustration of meaning. So what we need to do is start looking at what are different ways in which people derive social worth? Creative economy is one, but not everyone is creative. We need to look at more prosaic ways. People in online communities, they have they shared something, they become popular. That's what sort of drives them, and they have a basic income and they're perfectly happy to become popular. So as academia and as civil society, we need to understand where do people derive social worth? Just as an insurance policy, if the wolf is real this time. 
And we're going to take that as a comment rather than a question. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Not because it wasn't, because it, it could be, but also yeah. mostly because we're out of time. It's a very good um, comment. So I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I learned a lot, and I hope you guys did too. And it's obviously just the beginning. I mean, this is an unprecedented time in which we're living. The solutions are murky. The change and the wolf are here. And we're all going to be living it and experiencing it, and I hope thriving in it as well. So please join me in thanking this great panel, CBK, Arlie, Yuval, and Mary.